Hi guys, and welcome to this virtual lecture course on quantum condensed matter physics. I'm Dr. Andrew Mitchell, and in this lecture we're going to be talking about Green's function theory for quantum many-body systems. This builds upon the work that we developed in the previous lecture. There we introduced the fundamentals of Green's function theory and talked about explicitly the solutions for the retarded Green's function and the uh, spectral function for a single isolated quantum orbital. Of course, this is an extremely simple system, but it's one that we could solve exactly and talk about the properties in detail. Of course, this is not really corresponding to any interesting physical system, and that's why in this lecture, we'll be developing this theory much further and applying it to real systems, and uh, we'll be using this theory to obtain some useful results. In this lecture, we'll actually look at a special class of quantum many-body systems, namely quadratic Hamiltonians, these are non-interacting systems. For these systems, I'll show explicitly that because we have a diagonal representation of the Hamiltonian that can be obtained by simply a canonical transformation of the operators, I can always relate the Green's functions of such a system to the Green's functions of the non-interacting isolated quantum gas, meaning that we can use the results that we derived in the previous lecture. So we're building quite heavily upon that in this lecture. What I'll show is that we can derive Green's functions for generic uh, Hamiltonians and that these can actually be related very, very simply to the original parameters of the Hamiltonian. We don't actually need to diagonalize the system fully. We simply need to invert some matrices. I'll show how this can then be used to understand the properties um, of large systems actually in the thermodynamic limit of an infinite number of sites. The Green's functions contain information about the correlations and the dynamics of the system, and so actually has a really important wealth of information contained within them. So there are facts that we're able to extract this for quantum systems involving an infinite number of particles is actually quite remarkable. In the second part, I'll talk about a formulation of the Green's function theory, which allows us to take two uncoupled systems and join them together. If we know the Green's functions for the isolated system, we can easily work out the Green's function for the coupled system. This then allows us to work out a recursive Green's function method where we can really solve infinitely um, large problems. Problems, um, for example, with some physical interest, for example, a material which might have an infinite number of sites in it on a periodic lattice. And we'll also look explicitly at the example of molecular electronics, where, for example, we have a single molecule connected to two macroscopic electrodes. The dynamics of this system tell us about the density of states, they tell us about the conductance properties and so on. And these are the things that we'll be able to access towards the end of this lecture. So let's get down to work. In this lecture, we'll be talking about the Green's functions for many electron systems, which are non-interacting or quadratic. Of course, not all Hamiltonians are quadratic. However, this is a prominent and important category of system. We will be discussing the interacting case in a future lecture. In the last lecture, I introduced the basics of Green's function theory for condensed matter physics. In particular, we talked about the Keldish G lesser and G greater functions, as well as G retarded. We saw how the spectral function is related to the retarded Green's function, and in turn, this is basically giving us the density of states of our system. The spectral function is also related to the occupation of the orbitals, as we saw from the fluctuation dissipation theorem. So in this lecture, we're going to focus only on the retarded Green's functions. Here I've written out again the definition of the retarded Green's function in the time domain. I denote by Gij of t the retarded Green's function involving the operator Ci evaluated at the time t and the operator Cj dagger evaluated at time zero. I'm implicitly assuming here that the system is time independent. This will be the case that we'll examine in this lecture. We can define the retarded Green's function in the frequency domain, or I should say complex frequency, by using the Laplace transform. Gij of the complex variable z is defined as being the integral dt from zero to infinity of e to the izt times the retarded Green's function in the time domain. Here, the complex argument z is given as omega plus i delta, 
omega and delta are both real, and in fact, for the retarded function, delta must be greater than zero. We discussed the reasons for this in the previous lecture. It's to do with convergence of these integrals. Omega here is to be understood as the real frequency. However, g of z is defined everywhere in the upper half complex plane. That basically just means that z has an imaginary part, which is positive. In these lectures, I'll be using the so-called Zubarev notation to denote the retarded Green's function as a function of the complex argument z, obtained by the Laplace transformation of the retarded g of t. With this Zubarev notation, g i j of z is given by this object with these double angle brackets. We see the two operators in question, ci and cj dagger. Of course, in the time domain, we know that ci carries uh, the label t and cj is evaluated at t equals zero. But then we're Laplace transforming this time difference to the complex variable z. This is denoted here by the subscript z. The two operators are separated by this semicolon. As a mnemonic here, we can imagine that one of these angle brackets is the thermal expectation value in the original expression, and the second one basically means performing the Laplace transformation. We'll see that this compact notation is rather useful in the following. We also defined in the last lecture a spectral function, a of omega. Here I'm writing this down for a specific orbital i, so I denote this a i of omega. It is defined as being the limit of delta goes to zero whilst keeping it infinitesimally positive of minus one upon pi of the imaginary part of the local g retarded as a function of omega plus i delta. What I mean by the local retarded function here is that I have the same orbital index for the two operators. I'm looking specifically at g i i. In the last lecture, we spent some time looking at the properties of a single orbital and then generalized this to the next most simple case of a non-interacting electron gas. And I've written down the Hamiltonian here for that system. This is what's referred to as a diagonal Hamiltonian. We see that we just have a bunch of uncoupled orbitals, each of which is labeled by some index k, and they have associated single particle energy epsilon k. Because there is no coupling in this Hamiltonian between orbitals of different k, we have exact eigenstates of H, which are product states. We utilized this feature in the previous lecture to determine some important properties of the associated Green's functions. In particular, we found that the retarded Green's function in the time domain is given by minus i theta of t, e to the minus i epsilon kt, times the Kronecker delta, delta kk primed. Recall that this object is equal to one if k is equal to k primed, but is equal to zero if k is not equal to k primed. The theta function here is the heaviside step function, which is equal to zero for t negative and one for t positive. Laplace transforming this to the frequency domain, we have the retarded g k k primed as a function of the complex variable z. This is the Zubarev notation for that. And that is given by delta of k k primed over z minus epsilon k. The important thing about the Green's functions for this non-interacting electron gas is that they are diagonal. That means that they are only finite if k is equal to k primed, and they're zero otherwise. Of course, the example of the non-interacting electron gas, where the Hamiltonian is diagonal in operators, is a very specific one. However, it's a very important case. In fact, as we've seen in the previous lectures, any quadratic Hamiltonian can be cast in this form by simply performing a canonical basis transformation. This is referred to as diagonalizing the Hamiltonian operator. This actually means that we'll always be able to write down our Green's functions for a quadratic system as a sum of terms that look like the single particle Green's function. So let's see how that works in detail. In general, for a quadratic Hamiltonian, we do not have the diagonal representation. We can write the Hamiltonian operator h hat as the sum over sites i and j of some coupling parameter t i j times the operators c i dagger c j. 
This corresponds to a quantum tunneling from orbital j to orbital i, and the tunneling strength is precisely Tij. However, the Hamiltonian should be Hermitian, meaning that h dagger is equal to h, and this implies that Tij is equal to Tji star, the star here denoting the complex conjugate. Given that Tij is equal to Tji star, we know that the diagonal terms Tii must be real, and indeed they are the single particle energies. They would be the things associated with the number operator Ci dagger Ci in this Hamiltonian. I'm not going to distinguish here between Tij's where i is equal to j and i is not equal to j, I'm just going to lump all of this together in the same matrix T. As discussed at length in the previous lectures, we will now introduce a vector operator, C vector dagger, which will simply be all of the C daggers in the system, C1 dagger, C2 dagger, C3 dagger, and so on, all the way up to Cn dagger for a system of n degrees of freedom. We'll also collect all of the Tij's up into a matrix, and I'll denote the matrices in this lecture with this double line underneath. And this matrix is defined such that the ijth element of the matrix is Tij. Using this notation, we can write the Hamiltonian operator h hat simply as c vector dagger t c vector, where this c vector is just the adjoint of c vector dagger, the adjoint meaning, of course, the conjugate transpose. So this is just a nice compact way of writing down the Hamiltonian operator, but it actually helps us also with a basis transformation which takes the Hamiltonian into diagonal form. We perform a canonical transformation of the operators from the c's to the f's. We imagine that we have an analogous vector containing all of these operators f, which are again numbered from 1 to n for a system of n degrees of freedom, and the transformation is determined by this matrix u, which is a unitary matrix, meaning that u dagger u is equal to the identity matrix, or put another way that the inverse of u is u dagger. We showed in the previous lectures that a canonical transformation necessitates this matrix being a unitary matrix, and that's because a canonical transformation is one that preserves the fermionic anti-commutation relations. It can easily be shown that if u is unitary, then the f operators will satisfy the proper canonical fermionic anti-commutation relations if the c operators do the same. So this is a proper basis transformation. Of course, there are many different forms that you can take while still being unitary, but we wish to find the specific transformation that diagonalizes the Hamiltonian operator. Substituting this expression into our Hamiltonian, we obtain the following, where now we can identify the combination u dagger t u as a matrix D, which should be diagonal. All of this means that diagonalizing the Hamiltonian operator means finding the unitary transformation u such that u dagger t u is diagonal, meaning that elements of the matrix D are proportional to the Kronecker delta. And indeed, the finite diagonal elements dii are simply equal to epsilon i. The epsilon i's are the eigenvalues of the matrix T, and physically they correspond to the single particle energies of the f orbitals. We can now write the Hamiltonian operator in this diagonal form. Now we can utilize the results of the previous lecture. We can write down immediately that the retarded Green's function g k k primed of z, meaning this object in the Zubarev notation, is equal to delta k k primed over z minus epsilon k. However, this is not necessarily the Green's function that we're interested in. Typically, we're interested in the Green's function for the physical orbitals of the system, rather than these transformed orbitals. We're interested in the Green's function for the c orbitals, not the f orbitals. Luckily, we can easily relate one to the other, because we have the explicit form of the canonical transformation embodied here. So let's now look at the retarded Green's functions for our quadratic system in the original or physical basis of the c orbitals. We can relate the f orbitals to the c orbitals through this canonical transformation, parameterized by the unitary matrix u, which I can write out for a given f orbital fk, 
we know the Green's functions in terms of the f orbitals from the previous lecture. However, what I'd like to know is the Green's functions of the c orbitals. I will denote these g i j of z, which in Zubarev notation means the Green's function formed by the operators c i and c j dagger. For this, I need to know the inverse transformation. How do I relate the c operators to the f operators? Well, if I pre-multiply this expression by u dagger, then I obtain the following. However, by definition, u dagger u is equal to the identity. And this tells us that my vector of operators for the c orbitals is equal to u dagger times the vector of operators for the f orbitals. And indeed, a given orbital, ci, can be expanded in this basis. I can therefore relate the operator for the orbital ci to the operator for the orbital fk. I can therefore write that gij of z is equal to the double sum over these expansion parameters times the Green's function between k and k primed in the f orbitals. This object is precisely the Green's function in the k basis, which is also proportional to the Kronecker delta, delta k delta kk primed. And this collapses the double sum over k and k primed to a single sum over k. And finally, we can substitute in the explicit form of the Green's function in the diagonal basis. And this leads to the following very important result, that the real space Green's function between uh, c orbitals i and j can be given as the sum of these single particle Green's functions. It's the sum over k of 1 over z minus epsilon k multiplied by the expansion coefficients. Here, they're given by u k i star times u k j. In particular, we can examine the behavior of the local Green's functions, which means g i i for the same c orbital i. Then, we see that the expansion coefficients become simply the square modulus of u k i. And of course, these are always real and positive numbers. We therefore have a weighted sum of the Green's functions for single orbitals. We can then write down the corresponding spectral function. A i of omega is defined as being minus one upon pi of the imaginary part of the local g retarded for orbital i evaluated with an infinitesimal positive imaginary part to the frequency. As we showed in the previous lecture, this can then be written in terms of the delta function of omega minus epsilon k. The spectral function for a real space orbital i in the c basis can therefore be expanded as the sum over k times this positive weight, uh, which is the square modulus of u k i, times this delta function. The spectral function is therefore the weighted sum of these delta functions. The delta functions count the number of states occurring at a given energy epsilon k, whilst these weights tell us, whereas the weights here can be understood as probability amplitudes. They are basically the weights of the wave function k at the real space c orbital site i. So here we've learned that by diagonalizing our Hamiltonian, we can immediately write down the Green's functions and the spectral functions for our system. These simply involve the wave function coefficients contained in the unitary matrix U and the eigenenergies, which are the epsilon k's. Also note that the spectral function a i of omega is normalized to one, since the eigenvectors in the unitary matrix U are orthonormal. The spectral function can therefore be viewed as a density of states. It tells us the probability of finding a state at a given energy. So let's have a look at a concrete example. Let's return to the simplest 1D type binding chain that we studied in the lecture on type binding models. The Hamiltonian is given as follows, and here I'm going to use specifically periodic boundary conditions, meaning that in this sum of x from 1 to n, I will of course get uh, an operator here c n plus 1, which is outside of our system, but I loop that back round and say that c n plus 1 is basically equal to the first orbital.
This is basically then making a ring out of our 1D chain. Every site in the system is equivalent to every other because we have no boundaries, and the whole thing is periodic. We can now diagonalize this system using a discrete Fourier transformation of the operators. We go from the real space of the coordinate x to the momentum space, which here takes these discrete values kj equals 2 pi j over n, where n is the system size. As n goes to infinity, the momentum becomes a continuous variable. In the previous lectures, we showed that this Fourier transformation diagonalizes the Hamiltonian operator in this way, and we have an explicit expression for the dispersion relation epsilon k, which in this case is 2t cos k. Again, the momentum k is taking these discrete values when n is finite. We can now immediately write down the Green's functions in momentum space. gkk of z is simply 1 over z minus epsilon k. However, what we'd really like to know is the Green's functions for the original c orbitals in real space. As I've already emphasized, with periodic boundary conditions, every site in the system is equivalent to every other, and therefore all of the local Green's functions will be the same. For simplicity, let's choose the site x equals n. The local Green's function then is gnn of z. We can express this in terms of the momentum space Green's functions, as explained on the previous slide. We now expand the real space Green's function in terms of these momentum space Green's functions, and we have these Fourier factors. Because these momentum space Green's functions are diagonal in k, it means that these Fourier factors will also cancel out. Overall, then, we see that the local Green's function in real space is basically equal to the average of the momentum space Green's functions. This 1 over n outside the front here ensures that the Green's function is properly normalized. We can now examine the behavior of the spectral function for a given site. This is basically giving us the local density of states. It's defined as usual in terms of the imaginary parts of the local retarded Green's function as we approach the real axis. We see directly that this is then basically the average of the spectral functions in momentum space, which can be written in terms of these delta functions. Again, we see directly here, given that j runs from 1 to n, that the spectrum is properly normalized to 1. So let's visualize how this density of states looks like. Here I've just summarized the information. We have the original Hamiltonian in the real space. We have the diagonalized Hamiltonian in momentum space with this dispersion relation and this relation for our discrete momenta. The spectral function of any site x Ax of omega is given by this expression in terms of delta functions with frequencies pinned to the dispersion. We can then plot the spectral function for a given system size n. Here I'm doing this for n equals 22, and we see that we have in fact 11 distinct poles because of a degeneracy in the system, and they're distributed something roughly like this. As you can see from the sketch, the poles tend to be bunched around the band edges here. You'll also note, of course, that there is this minimum and maximum energy inside which we can have states. Um, that's determined by uh, the form of the dispersion relation here. Because we have a cosine of the momentum here, then obviously the amplitude uh, is 2t, and therefore the allowed energies go between minus 2t and plus 2t only. And we refer to this as a band. There are no states that live outside of the band. So here we really see that the spectral function is the density of states. It tells us when we have a state at a given energy. For these discrete systems, we can just break this down into delta functions. But the situation is rather more subtle when we consider the thermodynamic limit of many sites in the system. For example, what happens when n goes to infinity? We should then obtain a continuum spectral function, still bounded between minus 2t and plus 2t, set by the form of the dispersion here, but then we have an infinite number of these delta functions. So in the limit of an infinite number of delta functions, what does this spectral function look like? How do we interpret that? One way to think about the approach to the thermodynamic limit is to actually artificially broaden each of these delta functions into a Lorentzian, for example. Let's give each of these delta functions some finite but narrow width. For example, I can replace this a delta function here drawn in red by this Lorentzian drawn in blue. And let me do that for all of these poles. 
In that case, we would see something like this. Obviously, the resulting spectral function will have lots of peaks, but rather than delta functions, now they're genuine peaks of finite height and finite width. But something else is happening. When we see that the poles are bunched together, for example at the edge here, we see that uh, these uh, peaks are sort of overlapping with each other. Therefore, when we add up the contributions from each of these peaks to the overall spectral function, we'll see that the density of states in the spectral function is larger in this region where we have lots of delta peaks bunched together. When we add up all the contributions for these Broughton peaks, we'll obtain something that looks a bit like this. Of course, we can also play around with the system size and also the broadening of these peaks. As we increase our system size, we'll get more peaks. Therefore, the overlap of the broadened delta functions will be more pronounced. For a given system size, we can also increase the broadening to increase the overlap. If we go to a large number of sites, for example n equals 100, we might see something like this. And indeed, you can convince yourself that in the thermodynamic limit, as n goes to infinity, for any finite broadening of these poles, we'll get something that looks entirely smooth. In the thermodynamic limit, we in fact obtain something like this, with divergences in the density of states at the band edges, and something finite near omega equals zero. Later on in the lectures, we'll show how to extract this exact curve analytically. For now though, I want to give you some intuitive understanding of how we can go from the discrete finite size system to the thermodynamic limit by first considering a bunch of poles in the spectral function and then broadening those poles. As we increase the system size, we can decrease the broadening of each of the poles. And in fact, as n goes to infinity, the broadening can go to zero. This might actually be reminiscent of the mathematical procedure we used to obtain the spectral function in the first place. We considered that as the limit of the uh, imaginary part of the frequency going to zero. And actually, we'll see that it's closely related. So let's look in more detail at the broadening of discrete spectral data, which approximates the thermodynamic limit, wherein one obtains a continuous density of states in finite bands. The heuristic strategy we used on the previous slide was simply to replace the delta functions by Lorentzians. Mathematically, we simply replace the delta functions by this equation, where delta is the broadening of the Lorentzian. In general, then, we can replace our spectral function for a given site x, which is denoted ax of omega, by a spectral function that depends also on the broadening of the poles. I'll refer to this as ax of omega and delta. We therefore have a sum over poles j times the weight of those poles, as derived on the previous slides, and then instead of the delta function, we have this Lorentzian centered on epsilon j and of width delta. The spectral function at frequency omega therefore has contributions from all of these peaks, which are now of finite width. But we can see from this that the spectral function ax of omega and delta is actually simply minus 1 upon pi of the imaginary part of the local retarded Green's function, where now we're evaluating this at um, omega plus i delta with finite delta. This is because the local retarded Green's function can be written as these sum of poles. Each has a weight and it is centered on the eigenvalue epsilon j. If we take minus one upon pi of the imaginary part of this, then we'll obtain exactly this expression written in blue. So the true spectral function ax of omega can actually be understood as the limit of delta goes to zero plus of this broadened spectral function ax of omega and delta. So here we have a mathematically well-defined way of broadening our discrete spectral data. We recover the exact spectrum as we take delta goes to zero plus. But for finite delta, this is basically broadening the poles and allowing us to approximate the thermodynamic limit in systems that are not infinitely large. So let's have a look at this in practice. What I will do is show a Mathematica notebook in which um, I will implement this expression directly for the 1D chain. Using our cosine dispersion for epsilon j, we will see that we can recover the thermodynamic limit with a careful balance of tuning delta and the system size n. OK, so in this Mathematica notebook, I'm expressing the Green's function as a sum over poles with frequency omega, broadening delta, and system size n.
As I increase the broadening, I see that the poles begin to overlap, and I have a more smooth function. Here I have a system size of 30 with a very small broadening, but as I increase the broadening, I start to see something smoother emerge. It's a careful balance between the system size and the broadening. If we increase the system size for a given broadening, then we see the approach to the thermodynamic limit. For example, here I have 100 sites and 0.01 broadening, and I can start to see what it will look like in the large system size limit. As I increase this to 1000 sites, I start to see basically the result of the infinite system and the smooth spectral function. In fact, aside from being a convenient mathematical prescription to visualize our spectral poles, we can actually assign a physical interpretation. The broadening of spectral lines, which we introduced here by using this finite imaginary part in the frequency, can actually be viewed as a lifetime broadening. This is a concept that you might have encountered in the context of atomic physics. When a quantum state has a finite lifetime, rather than being infinitely long-lived, then its spectral line gets broadened. We can actually view the same thing here. Consider some quantum state with a finite characteristic lifetime, which we'll call tau. This just means that the probability of finding a particle in this state will decay proportional to e to the minus t over tau. This finite lifetime could be the result of processes or interactions that scatter the particle out of the state, or it could be a quantum tunneling of the particle through the barrier of a confining potential. Later on in the course, we'll actually look explicitly at some of these examples and see how they lead to this finite lifetime. For now, however, we're just going to build in this finite lifetime heuristically into our definition of the Green's functions. We incorporate the decay of the Green's function on the heuristic level by approximating g of t, the retarded Green's function in the time domain, as minus i theta of t e to the minus i epsilon t as usual, but now multiplied by this decay factor e to the minus t upon tau. On performing the Laplace transformation to the frequency domain of complex z, we then find this retarded Green's function. Notice that the characteristic lifetime now appears downstairs as i over tau. Now we can look at the definition of the spectral function, where we really take the complex frequency to the real axis and send this imaginary part of the frequency to an infinitesimal positive number. However, in this case, we do not simply get a delta function, because downstairs we have a finite imaginary part set by the lifetime tau. Only when we have an infinite lifetime, when the state does not decay at all, do we see that this imaginary part vanishes. Only for an infinite lifetime, therefore, do we recover the delta function. For any finite lifetime, we'll have some broadening of the peak. This is basically the lifetime broadening of the spectral poles. In this case, the spectral function takes the following form. This is, of course, a Lorentzian of width 1 over tau. So, even though we've taken the imaginary part of the complex frequency to zero, we still end up with a Lorentzian of a finite width because of the finite lifetime. So we see that the inverse lifetime, 1 over tau, is playing exactly the same role as our finite delta. When we approximate our pristine delta functions by Lorentzians of width delta, we can actually view this as simply giving our quantum states a finite lifetime, where that lifetime is exactly 1 over delta. We'll see some examples later on explicitly that when we couple a quantum orbital to an external bath, we have exactly this kind of lifetime broadening, and the delta functions turn into Lorentzians. We also get a broadening of delta functions into peaks of finite width, when we allow for the electron-electron interactions in a system due to the Coulomb repulsion. Again, we'll see that later. So there are various mechanisms for scattering that confer a finite lifetime to a state, and heuristically, we can imagine this as simply broadening the poles. We can then emulate that simply by giving our frequency a small imaginary part. Let me finally say a few words about how to obtain the Green's functions and the density of states in the continuum limit. For a finite system of n sites, we just saw how we can write the Green's functions for a given site of our 1D system as 1 upon n of the sum over site j times the Green's functions in the diagonal basis 1 over z minus epsilon kj. Epsilon kj is the dispersion 2t cos kj with the discrete momenta points kj 
is equal to 2 pi j over n. However, as we increase the system size and take n goes to infinity, this momentum variable k becomes continuous. Then we can define uh, the dispersion relation epsilon k is 2t cos k as a continuous function of k. And then we can replace this sum by an integral. In practice, we replace sums by integrals. The dispersion is the same, but the k is now continuous. We can then write the retarded Green's functions in the continuum representation as 1 over 2 pi integral dk of 1 over z minus 2t cos k. This is actually not an easy integral. The standard approach would probably involve contour integration and doing some complex analysis. Um, however, I think you can probably also do this with a t substitution, although that would be a bit laborious. After a bit of algebra, one can prove the following result for the Green's function. This is not exactly straightforward, but have a go and leave your solutions in the comments. We can then obtain the spectral function in the usual way to obtain this result. In particular, we see that the imaginary part of g is only finite within a band from minus 2t to plus 2t. If we were to plot this function, then we recover something that looks very much like what we deduced on the previous slides. Notice in particular the square root divergence of the density of states near the band edges. Similarly, we can think about the integral representation of the Green's function in the continuum limit of the 2D square lattice. In that case, we have the exact dispersion relation epsilon k, where k is now a vector in the two-dimensional space, it has components kx and ky, which reads 2t cos kx plus 2t cos ky. The retarded Green's functions in real space for a given site r on the lattice can then be expressed as the integral over kx and ky of 1 over z minus epsilon k. So what is the answer to this integral? Well, that's actually a hard one. I'll leave that one for you to think about. However, it turns out that these Green's functions can actually be expressed as the convolution of Green's functions for the 1D chain. But that's another story. If we were to sketch the corresponding density of states, we'd see something like this, which is finite within a band of half width 4t and has this divergence this time near zero energy. This is referred to as a Van Hove singularity, and it corresponds to the bunching of the eigenstates at special high symmetry points in the reciprocal space of the first Brillouin zone. Hopefully you can see that the exact analytic evaluation of these uh, momentum space integrals actually becomes very difficult very quickly. And so we actually need to be a bit more clever about finding our Green's functions. And that's what the remaining content of these lectures will be about. Before we talk more about the calculation of the Green's functions and the spectral functions from theory, let me first say a word or two about how we can measure the spectral function in an actual experiment. This basically corresponds to either photoelectron spectroscopy or scanning tunneling spectroscopy. In order to probe the single particle properties of any, a many-body system, we have to have a way of measuring how the electrons propagate in the sample as a function of energy. If we think again about the fundamental definitions of the Green's functions, they correspond to the probability of taking out an electron at a given point in space at a given time, given that we put it into the system at a different place at a different time. Therefore, if we want to measure these things in an experiment, we need a way of putting in or taking out particles and measuring their energy. Basically, we need to insert or remove a single electron into or out of our many-body system and be able to measure the energy of that particle. An important experimental technique to achieve this is called angle-resolved photoelectron spectroscopy, or ARPES. The single particle electron density of states as a function of energy and momentum can be obtained using ARPES. The basic experimental setup is depicted here. The idea is that we fire a photon into our material and an electron is kicked out from an occupied state. We then have a detector that picks up the electron at a specific angle of emission. We then subject the electrons in the detector to a magnetic field 
which by the Lorentz force causes a cyclotron motion, and by measuring the radius of that orbit, we can then determine the kinetic energy of the particle. So we know the energy of the incident photon and the energy of the emitted electron, and we also know the angle of incidence and of emission. This allows us to construct this type of diagram, where we're plotting the kinetic energy in electron volts versus the emission angle. The color scale in this 2D plot corresponds to the number of counts in our detector. It's basically the probability of obtaining an electron in the detector at a given angle with a particular energy. This probability is then related to the density of states of the occupied orbitals in the material from which the electrons were emitted. If the density of states of a given Bloch orbital is equal to zero, then this means that that orbital is unoccupied. Therefore, there will be zero probability of an electron being emitted from that state. Conversely, if we have a high density of states for a given orbital, then there'll be a high probability of an electron being emitted from that orbital. All of this allows us to draw the following kind of diagram, where we can plot the density of states as the color map here as a function of the energy and of the momentum. So ARPES is a powerful way of determining experimentally the density of states of a sample as a function of momentum and energy. And of course, this is related to the retarded Green's functions in momentum space. A complementary experimental technique is so-called scanning tunneling spectroscopy. This allows us to determine the local density of states as a function of energy in real space rather than the momentum space. This might be useful in the case where we have spatial inhomogeneities in the sample that we want to resolve, for example, due to defects. The basic idea is that we move the tip of our scanning tunneling microscope close to our sample and then apply a potential difference between the microscope and the sample. An electronic current will then flow between the microscope tip and the sample due to quantum tunneling into or out of the localized orbitals of our sample. This tunneling rate is then proportional to the local density of states of the system. All of this is illustrated schematically on the left here. On the right hand side is a very nice example of this, where we see some impurity defects on the surface of a material, which are visualized using this scanning tunneling microscope. The 2D plots here are in real space on the surface and really give us a microscopic view of the system. We can make a set of these plots at different energies. In particular, you can see interesting quantum effects in these corals, where we get these kind of wave-like features. These are really waves in the electron density of our sample. And of course, this beautifully illustrates the wave-particle duality of electrons in quantum systems. So these techniques really give us a wealth of interesting information about the quantum nature of these systems on the nanoscale. And from the theoretical point of view, all of this can be understood in terms of the corresponding Green's functions. OK, so now let's return to the exact representations of our Green's functions for finite systems, where we have infinitely long-lived states and our spectral function consists of delta peaks. Again, in this lecture, I will consider explicitly the non-interacting case where we have a quadratic Hamiltonian. In that case, as I already summarized in this very lecture, we can write our Hamiltonian operator in this nice simplified form, where C vector dagger here is a vector of our creation operators, and the matrix T has elements ij, which are simply the tunneling matrix elements Tij. We can then perform a canonical transformation of our operators from the Cs to the Fs, parameterized by this unitary matrix U, such that the Hamiltonian takes a diagonal form. In particular, we can define this matrix D, which is U dagger T U, which is diagonal, meaning that its elements are proportional to the Kronecker delta, and the diagonal elements are simply the eigenvalues of our matrix T. We can then define our retarded Green's functions for the f orbitals. I'll denote these uh, as gij of z with this superscript f here to emphasize the fact that we're talking about the diagonal representation. In Zubarev notation, we simply have the retarded Green's function taking this form. And because it's a diagonal representation, these Green's functions are very simple. They are proportional to the Kronecker delta, and therefore are only finite if sites i and j are the same.
and downstairs we have, as usual, z minus epsilon i. Let's now introduce a Green's function matrix. In an obvious notation, we'll simply say that elements of this Green's function matrix, which I'm denoting here with the double line underneath, will simply be the gij's. And of course, because of the definition of the gij's being proportional to the Kronecker delta, we know that this Green's function matrix is itself a diagonal matrix. Indeed, we can actually express this matrix of Green's functions in terms of our matrix D, because this matrix D is also diagonal. I can write it simply as the complex variable Z multiplied by the identity matrix minus the matrix D, all inverse. The matrix Zi minus D is a diagonal matrix, and the inverse of a diagonal matrix is simply given by the inverse of each of its diagonal elements. Each of those elements is then correctly an element of this Green's function matrix, which is also diagonal, of course. This might seem a bit gratuitous, but now we can use the magic of matrix manipulations to find the Green's function in the original basis of the C operators. Let's denote the Green's function of the physical C orbitals uh, as G superscript C xy, which in Zubarev notation is given by this. We're talking about the Cx operator and the Cy dagger operator. Simply using this canonical transformation, I can then relate that to Green's functions in the F basis as follows. From the definition of the matrix product, I can now write the matrix of Green's functions in the C basis simply as the transformation u times the matrix of Green's functions in the F basis times u dagger. This is nice because I have an explicit representation of the Green's functions in the F basis in terms of the diagonal matrix D. Using that definition, I can write the following. Now I can rewrite this slightly using the properties of the inverse of the product of matrices. It's a standard result in matrix algebra. And this is the result that I obtain. In fact, I can further simplify this by noticing that u dagger times u is equal to the identity matrix by definition for a unitary transformation, and also that u dagger is therefore equal to u inverse. With these properties, I can write the following, where now I have the inverse of the matrix z times the identity minus u times d times u dagger. Now, from the definition of the matrix D in terms of our original matrix T, we can simply see that u, d, u dagger is actually equal to the matrix T. One can see that from this expression simply by pre-multiplying by u and post-multiplying by u dagger, and then using that u, u dagger is equal to the identity. So now we've arrived at the final result. We can write the Green's functions in a given basis, C, in terms of the inverse matrix of z times the identity minus t, where t is simply the original Hamiltonian matrix in the single particle basis. This is a very important and powerful result. It tells us that we can write down the matrix of Green's functions, and all we need to know is simply the Hamiltonian matrix in the single particle basis. The Green's function matrix is basically simply the inverse of the Hamiltonian. Actually, it's not quite the inverse of the Hamiltonian because we also have this factor of z times i. This object is actually called the resolvent. This result is completely general, and we did not assume anything about the system other than it is quadratic and can be cast in this form. Any non-interacting fermionic system can be written in this form, and therefore, once we've worked out what this matrix T is, we can immediately work out what the Green's function matrix is. Importantly, I want to emphasize that we can calculate the Green's function matrix without actually diagonalizing the Hamiltonian. We do not need to find the diagonal representation involving the energies epsilon i or the eigenstates contained in the matrix U. The matrix of Green's functions is simply obtained by taking the matrix inverse of the original single particle Hamiltonian matrix T. In practice, taking a matrix inverse is a lot easier than diagonalizing the matrix. This is extremely useful indeed, as I'll demonstrate by the following example. Consider the following example. It's the so-called Huckel model for the benzene molecule. Benzene is a molecule with six carbon atoms and six hydrogen atoms. However, a good description of the low energy physics 
comes from simply neglecting the hydrogens and considering only the pz orbitals of the carbon atoms. We therefore have a ring of six carbons, and we imagine that each of those pz orbitals can be described by creation and annihilation operators, uh, denoted cx, where x is a number from 1 to 6 that denotes the position on the ring. OK, so this is actually a tight binding chain with periodic boundary conditions, the likes of which we considered uh, earlier in this very lecture. The periodic boundary conditions here are equivalent to saying that if I put x is equal to 6 in this equation, I have an operator C7, but we should regard C7 simply as wrapping back round to the first orbital, C1. That creates this periodic ring structure. Diagonalizing this Hamiltonian gives us an understanding of what the molecular orbitals are in this system. But instead of doing that, let's just directly calculate the Green's functions in the basis of these orbitals. As usual, we'll introduce a vector of our creation operators. In this case, we have six orbitals in the system, so I have this vector C1, C2, C3, and so on, all the way up to C6. And the annihilation operator vector is just given as the dagger of this object. The dagger, of course, meaning the complex transpose. I can then simply express the Hamiltonian operator in this form, where the matrix T is given explicitly now by this 6 by 6 matrix. We have the leading off-diagonal elements simply by the tunneling matrix element T. Everywhere else is zero, except for these corners here, which are also given by T, and that's because of this periodic boundary condition. You should confirm to yourself that you agree with the form of this matrix. The Green's function matrix is therefore the matrix inverse of the complex argument Z multiplied by the 6 by 6 identity matrix minus the 6 by 6 matrix T, which I've written down explicitly here. When we perform the matrix inverse here, we will get something rather complicated for the elements of our matrix G. But at least we have a simple and exact procedure for obtaining these Green's functions. And this, of course, works for any system provided that it's a quadratic system, or one describing non-interacting fermions. Of course, being able to compute these Green's functions does rely on being able to invert these matrices, and computationally, we can only deal with matrices of a certain size. In particular, notice that the dimension of the matrix that we have to invert is an n by n matrix for a system with n orbitals. So actually, it's not as bad as it could be, it's not an exponentially large matrix in the dimension of our system, as it would be if we were looking at interacting systems. But let's come back to that another day. However, we are still limited by system size. We cannot invert matrices that are very, very large. For example, if we're looking at a material in the thermodynamic limit containing 10 to the 23 orbitals, then we simply cannot invert that kind of matrix to obtain these Green's functions. But we'll see later on that there are other methods that we can use to deal with these kind of systems. In the following, I want to develop further this theory of Green's functions for non-interacting and quadratic Hamiltonians, and we'll derive some useful and general results. We'll then apply these general results to some informative examples. The situation I want to consider now is what happens when we have two systems, A and B, and then we couple them together. The coupling between these systems can be totally general. What I would like to do is understand how the Green's functions of the coupled system are related to the Green's functions of the isolated systems A and B. We'll see that once we understand how this works, we can actually derive a lot of useful results using a recursive Green's function method. Previously, we derived that for a Hamiltonian H hat, which can be written in this form, with these vectors of operators and this matrix T describing the Hamiltonian matrix in a single particle basis, we can write down immediately the Green's function matrix, which is simply the complex uh, frequency Z multiplied by the identity matrix minus this Hamiltonian matrix. And then we take the matrix inverse. But now let's suppose that our overall Hamiltonian describing the full system can be broken down into a piece describing subsystem A drawn in red here, subsystem B, drawn in blue, and then a term describing the coupling between these two, which is referred to as a hybridization Hamiltonian, H hib. We can then write that the Hamiltonian for isolated subsystem A can be written as 
a vector operator CA dagger times a single particle Hamiltonian matrix TA times CA vector. Here, I'm defining CA vector dagger as a vector of the creation operators for the orbitals in the A subsystem. I'm labeling these CA1 dagger, CA2 dagger, and so on. And if we have n degrees of freedom in subsystem A, this vector will be of length n, and the last element will be CAN dagger. We can do exactly the same thing for subsystem B, where I've defined a CB vector dagger, uh, and this is of length m for subsystem B containing m degrees of freedom. Hamiltonian B is therefore determined by the single particle Hamiltonian matrix TB. TA and TB can be different and completely arbitrary, and in fact TA is an n by n matrix, whereas TB is an m by m matrix. The hybridization Hamiltonian couples the A subsystem to the B subsystem, and this is parameterized by the matrix V. This matrix V here is obviously an n by m matrix, and given that overall the Hamiltonian must be Hermitian, we know that the matrix connecting subsystem B to subsystem A must be the conjugate transpose, or the Hermitian conjugate, of the matrix connecting subsystem A to subsystem B. So if we call this one V, this one must be V dagger. V is an n by m matrix, V dagger is an m by n matrix. When we join our systems together, we form an overall C vector dagger operator, which is the thing that appears in this original equation here. And we arrange the information here in terms of the A subsystem first, and then the B subsystem. This first part is basically C A vector dagger, the second part is CB vector dagger, but we lump all of this into one big vector, CA1 dagger, CA2 dagger, and so on, all the way up to CAN dagger. And then we start on the Bs, CB1 dagger, CB2 dagger, and so on, all up the way up to CBM dagger. So overall, this vector is of length N plus M. Going back to our original formulation, we use this vector operator to form our Hamiltonian. This means that the matrix T here is of dimension n plus m by n plus m. So to summarize, we have two subsystems A and B coupled by some hybridization Hamiltonian. Overall, we can express the Hamiltonian in terms of this matrix T with n orbitals in subsystem A and m orbitals in subsystem B. The matrix T here is n plus m by n plus m and these vectors are of dimension n plus m. We break this down into pieces corresponding only to system A, to system B, and the hybridization between systems A and B. By comparing these, we can see that the matrix T is related to TA, TB, and V in the following way. We have a 2 by 2 block diagonal structure to the matrix T. So let's now have a look at the Green's functions for this system. I can write the Green's function matrix of the full system with a coupling between A and B as G inverse is equal to Z times the identity minus the matrix T. Here, the identity matrix is the same dimension as the matrix T, namely an N plus M by N plus M matrix. However, we can also look at the Green's functions for the isolated systems A and B. I'll denote those G A with this superscript zero to indicate that these are the Green's functions without the coupling. They're the Green's functions of the isolated system A. And of course, they're just simply given by Z times the identity matrix minus T A. Again, here, the identity matrix should be the same dimension as the matrix T A. And likewise, for Green's functions in the isolated B subsystem. Again, I emphasize here that the superscript zero indicates that these are computed for the isolated subsystems A and B whereas in this full Green's function, we don't have a superscript zero, that's for the fully coupled system. So given that the identity matrix is of course a diagonal matrix, we see that the inverse Green's function matrix inherits this two by two block matrix property of the original matrix T. In particular, I can write the inverse Green's function for the fully coupled system, G inverse here, simply in terms of the Green's functions for the uncoupled system, GA0 inverse, 
GB0 inverse, and the hybridization Hamiltonian matrix V. OK, so now we can get a useful result for the Green's functions of the coupled system in terms of the Green's functions for the uncoupled system. We do this by exploiting a standard theorem of matrix algebra, namely that if we have a block 2 by 2 matrix X, which has components which are also matrices A, B, C, and D, then we can write the inverse matrix X inverse, which has the same 2 by 2 structure with sub-matrices P, Q, R, and S. The theorem tells us that I can relate the sub-matrix A to the matrices P, Q, R, and S. In particular, we can write that A is equal to the matrix inverse of P minus Q, S inverse, R. For us, we will say that the matrix X is the matrix G of the full Green's functions for the fully coupled system, whereas X inverse is obviously G inverse, which is this matrix here. We can then identify P, Q, R, and S as these uh, inverse Green's functions of the uncoupled systems on A and B, as well as the matrix for the hybridization Hamiltonian V. Finally, we obtain our main result, that the Green's functions for orbitals living in region A in the fully coupled system, which is coupled to subsystem B, can be given in this way. We relate them to the Green's functions of the isolated subsystem A and B and the hybridization matrix V. This is an example of the so-called Dyson equation, where we relate the inverse Green's function of the full system to the inverse Green's function of the uncoupled system, minus this hybridization term here, where the hybridization delta is given by V GB0 V dagger. Since the matrix V is an N by M matrix, the matrix GB0 is an M by M matrix, and V dagger is an M by N matrix, when we perform this triple matrix product, we end up with a matrix delta, which is N by N. And of course, that's correct. This is dimensionally correct for this matrix equation. That's because the dimension of the A subspace and these Green's function matrices here are N by N. So the Dyson equation basically tells you how you relate Green's functions for the free system with this superscript zero here to the fully coupled system by introducing a coupling between the subsystems. And here we have an explicit expression for that hybridization matrix. So I want to illustrate the use of this formula with some nice examples. First, let's consider a model for a nanowire, which is a semi-infinite one-dimensional chain. Here is the usual tight binding Hamiltonian for such a system. Notice because we start with a sum on x equals 1, this system is not periodic, and therefore we cannot use the Fourier transformation to diagonalize this system. But we'll see that we can utilize the formula that we just derived to find the explicit equation for the boundary Green's function of such a system. Pictorially, we have a one-dimensional chain of these quantum orbitals labeled by x equals 1, 2, 3, and so on. We're going to be interested in calculating the, the local Green's function for orbital 1 at the end of the chain. Following on from the logic developed in the previous slides, we'll regard this first orbital here as our subsystem A, and the rest of the chain, which is itself a semi-infinite chain, is subsystem B. I will be able to relate the Green's function at the end of the chain here to the Green's function for this isolated site and the Green's function for the end of this uh, semi-infinite chain corresponding to section B. The coupling between regions A and B is of course just the tunneling coupling between the first and second sites. I can express the Hamiltonian in this usual form, where the matrix T is given explicitly by the following. As we've seen previously, this is just a tri-diagonal matrix, with these leading off-diagonals being the hopping element T. We can then formulate this matrix as a 2 by 2 block matrix, in which we have Hamiltonian matrices for region A, for region B, and the hybridization between them. Notice because we have a one-dimensional chain geometry, the hybridization matrices V here just have a single non-zero element, which is this T here. For the isolated subsystem A, we have a single orbital with zero level energy, and so the Green's function for the isolated system A is just a scalar quantity 
and it's trivial, it's simply 1 over z. For the uncoupled B subsystem, we actually have an infinite dimensional matrix of Green's functions, which I'll just denote here symbolically as GB0. This matrix is of course unknown. However, we can relate the full Green's function for subsystem A to the uncoupled Green's functions for subsystem A and for subsystem B. This is the formula that we derived on the previous slide. We then obtain the following scalar equation. Here we have to compute this triple matrix product, but because the form of this hybridization matrix V only contains a single non-zero element, this will just contract to a scalar. In fact, it's easy to show that this hybridization term here must be equal to T squared times the Green's function for the first site in the uncoupled subsystem B. So now we can develop a recursive algorithm for calculating these Green's functions. I can imagine now taking subsystem B and breaking it up further into the first site and the rest of the chain. Then I could write down an exactly analogous equation for this. This allows me to successively build up the chain, starting from the end and working my way down the chain. Furthermore, there's actually a self-similarity in this problem. The Green's function at the end of this semi-infinite chain here, which I'm denoting GA, is actually the same as the Green's function at the end of subsystem B, when it's uncoupled to subsystem A. That's because we still have a semi-infinite chain, and I'm looking at the Green's function at the end of that chain. This self-similarity tells us that the full Green's function GA is actually equal to the Green's function at the end of the uncoupled subsystem B. We then obtain that GA inverse is equal to GA0 inverse, which we know explicitly, it's simply 1 over Z, minus T squared of GA again. This is a quadratic equation for GA, and we can solve it to obtain, analytically, our Green's function at the end of the semi-infinite chain. Solving the quadratic equation for our boundary Green's function GA, I then obtain the following explicit expression. I can write that t times GA of z is equal to z over 2t minus i times this square root. Of the two roots obtained by solving this uh, quadratic equation, I chose here the minus sign, and that's because I want to have a corresponding spectral function, which is positive definite. The integral of the spectral function, of, sh of course, should come to plus 1. So here I need to choose uh, the negative imaginary part. We also see that the imaginary part is only finite within a band from minus 2t to plus 2t, exactly as we saw previously. Specifically, the spectral function that I obtain from this equation is 1 over pi t times the square root of 1 minus omega over 2t squared. This corresponds to a semicircular density of states within a single metallic band from energy minus 2t to plus 2t. And we see that the density of states at the Fermi level is exactly 1 over pi t. Let's now turn to the infinite one-dimensional chain, rather than the semi-infinite chain that we considered previously. Here, every site is equivalent to every other site. We don't have a boundary in the system. However, I can imagine dividing my system up into two semi-infinite regions, region A in red and region B in black, coupled by the single bond connecting the two. I can now look at the Green's functions at the end of this uh, uncoupled semi-infinite chain for region A, and I'll denote that GA011. Likewise, I can look at the Green's function at the end of the semi-infinite chain in region B of the uncoupled system. That's GB011. And of course, these are precisely the Green's functions that I just calculated on the previous slide, and they're also equal to each other by symmetry. And I also have a way of connecting the Green's functions for these uncoupled systems to the Green's functions for the coupled system. As before, I can relate the Green's functions for the full system living in region A to the Green's functions for the uncoupled subsystem A and the Green's functions for the uncoupled sub subsystem B. Doing the matrix inverse here, and then taking the 1, 1 element, I can obtain an expression for the Green's function in the middle of an infinite 1D chain. Utilising the specific form of the coupling between regions A and B, we obtain the following equation. We can then write the local Green's function for a site on this infinite chain 
which is of course equivalent to any other site. In particular, we're going to choose the boundary Green's function of the A subsystem, um, but in the fully coupled system. Um, we can then write that as the inverse of z minus 2t squared times this g b0 at the end of the b system. And this is, of course, just the semi-infinite chain Green's function that we just worked out. Substituting that result in explicitly, we have the following form for the retarded Green's function in the bulk of an infinite 1D chain. The corresponding spectral function then follows immediately as this function. And of course, this should look familiar. It's the same equation that we derived earlier in the lecture using the direct integration method. It has this 1 over square root form that we discussed earlier, with these van Hover divergences at the band edges. Finally, let me discuss an application of all of this formalism to an area of research that's really at the cutting edge of modern science. This application will be to molecular electronics. One of the important building blocks for molecular electronics devices is the single molecule transistor. This is where a single molecule is placed between two electrodes, as is shown here in this figure. This is the real experimental device that's constructed and built in the laboratory. These large gold electrodes here are extruded so they become atomically thin and separated just by a few angstroms, and then a single molecule is placed to bridge the gap. A current that flows in the external circuit involves electrons that have to tunnel quantum mechanically into and out of this molecule. Let's see if we can model this system and the dynamics of the electrons within the system using the formalism that we've developed in this lecture. Let's consider a model of the single benzene molecule transistor that's actually depicted here. The model is of course going to be a simplified one, but it's going to be something that will really capture some of the fundamental physics of this problem. We will model the benzene molecule, as described earlier in this lecture, simply as a six-membered tight binding ring. This is the Huckel theory for the benzene molecule. I'm going to describe the macroscopic metallic electrodes as nanowires which here we'll model as semi-infinite one-dimensional chains. Again, this is also something that we've looked at in this lecture. So, using the philosophy we developed in the last few slides, we're going to talk about the isolated systems for the individual leads, which we've talked about explicitly. We know the boundary Green's functions of these systems. And we're going to talk about the isolated molecule, which we looked at earlier in the lecture. Now, we can use Green's function theory to couple these three isolated things together. This is a non-interacting quadratic Hamiltonian. It's basically a tight binding model, and therefore we can cast it in this following form. Because we have an infinite number of sites in the system, the leads being infinite, the matrix T here is actually infinite dimensional. However, schematically, we can imagine dividing it up into these blocks. In the middle here, I have a Hamiltonian matrix which describes the molecule which is just a six by six matrix. Then we have matrices describing the infinite dimensional uh, leads, which uh, schematically I'm just denoting by these blocks here. And then I have the hybridization between the molecule and the left lead, and the hybridization between the molecule and the right lead. There's no direct hybridization between the two leads. On the previous slide, we discussed how we can obtain the Green's functions for two coupled systems. Now we have three systems, we have the molecule and two leads, but we can just break this down successively. First of all, for example, we can consider the molecule coupling to the left lead, and then we can consider this as our new system and coupling to the right lead. As before, we can write down our six by six matrix describing the isolated benzene molecule, and our infinite dimensional model for our semi-infinite nanowire. This is described by T leads, and here I'm using a different tunneling matrix element, let's call it T primed. Finally, we need a hybridization between the molecules and the leads. Let's say that is local and something parameterized by the tunneling matrix element V here. If I label the sites on the ring 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, we see that the hybridization is between the 1 orbital of the molecule and the left lead, and the 4 orbital of the molecule and the right lead. This is the particular geometry illustrated in the setup here. Let's now write that G0 leads is the Green's function of the isolated leads at the molecule position.
That's basically the Green's function at the end of this semi-infinite 1D chain. That's something that we worked out explicitly earlier in the lecture, so we can again borrow that result. Putting everything together that we've learnt in this lecture, we can now obtain an expression for the matrix of Green's functions on the molecule, which is a 6 by 6 matrix, in the presence of coupling to the leads. We have this expression, and I'll leave it as an exercise for you to confirm the structure of this. So, I hope I've managed to convince you in this lecture that Green's functions are an amazingly versatile and powerful theory to understand the quantum dynamics of complex many-particle systems. The Green's functions contain information about how the electrons move around in the system, their correlations in time. They're related to the density of states, which is a measurable observable in experiments. They're also related to quantum transport, meaning that in this molecular transistor, for example, if I apply a bias voltage between these leads, a current of electrons will start to flow. The current is obviously related to the probability of electrons transmitting from one side to the other through the molecule, and hence related to the propagators. These are exactly these non-local Green's functions. So again, Green's functions are very useful in understanding the properties of real systems. In this lecture, we derived a number of very useful results for quadratic Hamiltonians. In fact, we were able to derive all of the results in this lecture from simply knowing the retarded Green's function for a single isolated orbital, which we calculated explicitly in the last lecture. Everything else we derived basically just by using the tools of linear algebra. And in the end, we were able to formulate the Green's function dynamics of a complex system, for example, this molecular transistor, where we have an infinite number of sites in the system. This is a true many-body quantum problem, and exactly the kind of thing that we want to look at in condensed matter physics. Finally, I should emphasize that everything we've discussed here is for non-interacting systems. That's because we have basically used the result for independent fermions. We're assuming that we can diagonalize our Hamiltonian operator by performing a canonical transformation. In the next lecture, we'll look at equations of motion methods and the Lehman representation which allows us to deal also with interacting systems.